Hi everyone, today I was going to be going over a couple things regarding sketches that can be useful to know when you're designing something conceptually. And the first bit of that I wanted to talk about um, has to deal with equation curves. So if you drop down this little arrow under line, you can find equation curve there. And equation curve does what you would imagine it to do. It draws a curve on your sketch that is based on an equation. And that coordinate system can either be in terms of x and y or r and theta, depending on whether or not you choose Cartesian or polar coordinate system. Um, you also have this option of changing from parametric to explicit. Um, for all practical purposes, parametric is pretty much the only thing you would probably use since, well, we'll stick an example here. So if we go Cartesian here and we have this example of x squared, it gives you an error that the expected units are length. But if we go to parametric and we say t squared and we set that to t, it does exactly the same thing as it would in the explicit form, but it doesn't give an error. I don't know why it's like that, but it is. So for all practical purposes, you can you have any equation you want using simply parametric. So now that that's out of the way, um, it's important to know that when you're working with equation curves that they have some limitations. For example, the output of an equation curve has to be a finite value. So say we had equation curve 1 over t gives you an error since we know that dividing by 0 is not a finite value. It can go low, it can go to point 0.1, it can go to point zero 0.01, but it can't go to 0 because that's not a finite value. Um, also, equation curves can't intersect themselves. So that's usually not a problem when you're working in Cartesian, but if you're working in polar, uh, say we have the equation r equals 2 plus 2 times cosine 6t. Uh, for reference, that's supposed to look uh, like this. We can go from 0 to 29. We can go from 0 to negative 29. They're very close to each other, but as soon as we take this and go to 30, it gives you an error because it's going to be self-intersecting the other part of the curve. So those are a few of the limitations you need to keep in mind when working with equation curves. Now, at this point, you might be wondering what equation curves could actually be used for. Well, for polar equation curves, um, you have the application of a cam follower system. Say this cam is uh, going to be spinning around an axis and this follower is going to need a specific path of motion. You could use polar equation curves to map the path of that. So there are a lot of ways to uh, uh, make cams with equation curves. Um, so this example uses a 4, 5, 6, 7 polynomial curve. Uh, what's special about this is that the velocity, acceleration, and jerk at the start points and end points of lists are zero. Um, so for this particular section, we have a rise here, which corresponds to this equation, a dwell that corresponds to this equation, a negative rise, which corresponds to this equation, and another dwell, which corresponds to this equation. Um, so this is all very uh, conceptual. The The method of using equation curves to make uh, cams is sort of obsolete since uh, inventor assemblies have their own disk cam generator, which has all the different uh, methods of uh, creating cams there. Um, I don't want to go over this in too much detail right now since I want to focus on sketches here, but it's it's there so you don't have to do more work than you need to. So perhaps the most common type of application for equation curves that I've come across is through mapping projectile motion. 
So you'll have to forgive my lack of a better example here, but the concept is sort of the same. When you're working in Inventor, you can overlay a sketch on top of any image, part, or assembly. Um, so for this particular example, we have this fortress of pigs here, and we're going to be launching a bird from here, and we want it to hit approximately this area here. And we're going to use equation curves to figure out how fast we need to shoot this bird and at what angle. So uh, let's go to Excel here. And for those who are unfamiliar about how projectile motion works, I'm going to try to explain it as simply as possible. So um, these equations of motion have three primary parts. We have an acceleration term that's multiplied by a t squared. We have a velocity term that's multiplied by t. And a position that's just a constant here. So um, if we go to equation curves here, we have uh, both positions for x and y here, and positions for x and y here. So let's take a look at the acceleration terms first. So for the x position, the acceleration is zero, since after you launch it, it's not. It, there's no force applied to it that's going to be affecting it in the x direction. But for the y position, there's the force of gravity that's that is a constant of minus 32 inches per second squared. So um, now onto the velocity term, and the velocity term is dependent on the initial velocity and angle. So what these cells are representing is that uh, this initial velocity is being multiplied by the cosine of the angle to get your x velocity, and this cell says that the initial velocity is being multiplied by the sine of the angle to produce this velocity. So we could change these values and then these values would update automatically. Um, so those values are multiplied by t and then for the position term we're going to call this point here our origin so the initial y position is 48 inches above that so we have the 48 and then for the x position, it's starting at zero, so that's going to be zero also. So back in Excel, we can start picking values for initial velocity and angle to try and see what that's going to look like. So let's just start out with an arbitrary um, 100 inches per second at 30 degrees. So these x and y position equations are going to update automatically. And what we can do is we can copy those into Inventor, and that's what the path of motion is going to look like from 0 to 1 second. Um, and we can change that from 0 to 2 seconds, and from this we can see that it's a, it's not exactly reaching the, the point with, that we need. So we can go back to Excel and we can change this. So say I want to make this go faster, 200, and I'll increase the angle to 45 degrees. And we can take that, copy it, take that, copy it, and now we see that we have a bit of overkill here. So we can go back here, we can change this to 150, 40 degrees, Copy that, paste that there. That's there. That's where it's going to be after two seconds, and then after three seconds, it's going to be there. So that uh, hits approximately where we need it to. So by using this method, you could fairly quickly find out what sort of variables you need to set to get the kind of results that you want. However, it's important to note when you're conceptually designing something that the real-world results and the math aren't always the same thing. There's always going to be some real-world variable that you can't account for during math. But uh, by doing a method like this, um, you get a much better idea of what sort of requirements you need to get the results you want, while at the same time not egregiously overdoing it. And in your average situation, that's a lot better than winging it. No pun intended. So with that covered, there's just one more thing about sketches that I'd like to go over. 
So here's an example of how a sketch can be used to design or study something conceptually. So here we have a carrier assembly which is comprised of several different components. So we have trolleys here, tow bars that connect them, and a carrier with a car body on top of it. And we're going to study how this carrier moves across this curve that's drawn here. So one thing to note is that Anytime you import geometry into a sketch in Inventor, it comes in uh, unconstrained, like this, and that's not what you want. See, this, all this geometry is supposed to be one part, so it's all supposed to move as one, and at the same time, you don't want to go through the, all the tediousness of reconstraining everything. So, that's where blocks come in handy. So, if you select the geometry that you want, go up to Create, create block, hit OK, so you see what it did there, it clumped all this geometry together so now it all moves as one part. So that's good. For the purposes of this video I created blocks of all these other components beforehand, so uh, what's left to do now is to constrain these together like you would constrain an assembly. So if I take a coincident uh, constraint here and go from where I know it's going to be pivoting here to where I know it's going to be pivoting here, I can take those two points and it'll match them up together. And I can do the same thing with all the other parts, all the other pivot points here. So now that that's done and the carrier assembly is all put together, we can constrain the entire assembly to the curve to see how it's going to go through. So if I take this point, constrain it here, take the back, constrain it here, take this point, constrain it to the arc, So once that's done, you can grab a trolley block and move it, and what that'll do is it'll take the entire assembly and show you how it's going to be moved as the assembly moves through this curve here. So now you've got to take a minute to think about what's actually going to be studied here. So say for example you want to find a pinch point between a point on this car body to the tow bar here. So what you can do is take a line, draw from the point of interest, which can be any point you want, down, constrain it how you need to, and I want to know how far away that is, so I'm going to take a dimension, but I'm going to make sure it's a driven dimension, because I don't want it to be constrained there, I, I just want to have this here for a reference. So now that that's there, we can do the same thing we did. We can grab a trolley block, move it, and you can see that that dimension updates automatically in real time, which gives you a pr fairly precise way of seeing where that pinch point is. So um, that was it. Uh, thank you for watching, and I hope you've learned something.